Hello, I'm John Picton. I'm a lecturer in law here at the University of Liverpool. Uh, my taster lecture is on charity law. I want to do two things with this. I want to uh, explain uh, what an interesting subject it is uh, and also how it winds in uh, with uh, the course here at Liverpool. Uh, so, as you know by now, the course, and this is the same actually wherever you go across the whole country, is uh, divided into uh, core modules and uh, optional modules. Uh, and so uh, the core modules that you do, are equity and trusts, contract law, uh, criminal law, uh, tort law, European Union law, uh, all these things, as you'll know from university perspectives, uh, you study everywhere. And actually, charity law has a role to play. It is an element of equity and trust, one of the core modules, one of the foundational modules that you need uh, to know about the common law. And equity and trust essentially is a, a body of rules designed to manage money and designed to manage people's wealth. And so uh, it's maybe a little bit surprising that charities classed under there. But if you think about it, uh, a lot of charitable gifts are from very wealthy people. And so that's why charity and the management of money uh, go hand in hand. So charity law is part of that and it's part of the foundational course. We'll talk about that in a moment. But also, if you want to here at Liverpool, as part of our uh, social justice ethos, a part of our social justice theme, you can look at charity law uh, extra. You can do more charity law on top of what you do in the foundational subjects. Uh, and you can do that uh, because it's a really interesting topic that uh, has uh, a lot to say about the way the world is, about the way the world ought to be, and about the concept of social justice. And so that's in the third year if you want to do it. So starting with the foundational aspects of charity, what's the law traditionally? In some cases that are really very old and that's something that you have to get used to, that's part of the life of a lawyer, are seeing old cases that seem a bit old fashioned sometimes and saying how do they relate uh, to the present day? So what are the old ways in the old cases that uh, charity law is understood? Well, there are three big themes across the case law. One, and some of these might surprise you, because if you're thinking of charity, you might not think of, of these things really being what charity is. But remember what the law is and what the real world is are sometimes a little bit distinct. They have to be mapped onto each other. Uh, you need to do a bit of mental work to try and link what the judges have said uh, to the reality that we all know. So one, uh, the advancement of education. Someone who leaves money uh, to advance education is doing charity according to law. Uh, this can be controversial. Think of someone who leaves money uh, to establish or to uh, help a, a big independent uh, public schools such as Eton or Harrow. That's not what most people think of as charity, uh, but the law says it is. And because the law says it is, anyone who does that uh, gets tax advantages uh, when they uh, transfer their money, uh, they uh, benefit and have to pay less tax. Religion, again, that might surprise you. Um, People don't normally think of religion and charity as being associated, but the judges have said that for a very long time. So if you leave a gift uh, for uh, a particular church or chapel or any faith based organisation, then what you're doing is advancing religion. And again, the tax uh, benefits flow from that. And finally, more intuitive. This is what we do think of as charity, and this is in the old cases too. Uh, poverty. The relief of poverty is uh, closely associated with charity, and perhaps you will have thought of that just anyway. Uh, so uh, leaving money to a homelessness centre, again tax advantages are attached to that, the judges accept that that's a core charitable purpose, and that's 
pretty uncontroversial. So in all the old cases, judges have identified these themes as part of the definition of charity. And like I say, we have to go quite far back and quite deep and do a bit of work to say, what are these judges thinking charity is and how does that relate to what we think charity is? And some of these cases are quite old, they're quite removed from us, but they're still very, very interesting. So in Thornton and Howe, uh, there was a attempt to set up a charity to uh, promulgate, to get out there in the world, the teachings of uh, Joanna Southcote. This is a picture here of Joanna Southcote. And she uh, believed herself uh, to be the second Messiah. And she had a very sad life. Uh, she had a phantom pregnancy, which she believed was the second Messiah. Uh, of course, there was nothing there. She died shortly after, after that. She had a very sad life indeed. Uh, uh, but her religious teachings, you might think, and everyone's forgotten about her now, you might think of very little value. And so how is promulgating those religious teachings um, of any work that alone charitable? Uh, but in 1862, it's a, a, an old case, the court said that it was, and that um, promoting her teachings by charitable, and indeed they still would be today uh, if you wanted uh, to do that. So that was religion. We saw that was one of the old headings that the judges have identified as charitable. Education. Um, old headings judges have identified as charitable remains charitable today. All these old cases remain true today. They remain part of the definition of charity. And so just an example of this, another quite interesting example, uh, Ree Wilson. There someone died and left a gift to charity. In his will, and he tried to set up a school. He, didn't, he wasn't content with just giving money to a, an existing school, he wanted to set up his own one. And the main thing is he didn't leave enough money. So there wasn't enough money to carry out his plans. But not only that, the plan was incredibly uh, detailed. The plan involved uh, the precise location of the school. The timetable of the school is a picture of a uniform, the uniform that the school children were going to wear, the pay that the teachers were going to receive. So not only did he not leave enough money for his plans, but also he uh, made his plans really, really, really difficult to carry through his educational plans. And what could the courts do then? What could the judge do? Well, in that case, the money was given back to his next of kin. The money never went into charity uh, at all. So we've got two old cases there that show historic understanding of charity, but it's still true. It's still true. These old cases still mean something today. It's still true that the advancement of religion, the advancement of education, these are still charitable purposes in the present day. But is that really what modern charity is about? Well, if you're interested in the foundations of the subject, you certainly have to look at these old cases and as I say they're very interesting they tell us a lot about the past as well as about the present day is that what modern charity is about well not really not really some of these old cases now seem a bit old-fashioned to understand what charity is doing in the present day you have to take a different tack first of all I think you have to look at what the state does if you're going to understand what charity is, you have to understand what the state is doing. What do I mean by that? Well, we said, didn't we, that the relief of poverty is a core thing that everybody accepts that charity does. But the state in modern times goes a long way, or some of the way, towards alleviating poverty through welfare benefits, uh, job seekers allowance, and the such like. People don't have to necessarily rely on charity in order to survive, not anymore. As so we have to look at the state, that's a picture there of William Beveridge, one of the architects of the welfare state. And if you want to understand what modern charity is, you've got to go beyond these old cases, they're still relevant, but you've got to go beyond them and say, how does the state interact with charity? And after the welfare state was established, William Beveridge 
actually wrote on what he thought charity should do. And he imagines charity as something a bit more intuitive, something that we might now associate more with charity. And this is getting together, community spirit, so company for the sick and lonely, uh, social support for people with disabilities, company for old people and community groups. So this is a reimagining of charity. So the state comes in, alleviates poverty, well, provides education as well. We were talking about education before. What's left for charity? Well, the state's not involved in religion, that's still there. But what's left for charity? Well, it's community, so says William Beveridge. Uh, and other academic writers have uh, taken this view as well. So Robert Putnam, there's a picture of him, Robert Putnam, and he wrote uh, Bowling Alone, a uh, picture of the book there as well. And that's just a brilliant title for a book because it explains exactly in those, in those two words exactly what his book's about. And he, he has um, some research that shows historically people bowled together in bowling leagues in the USA. At the time he was writing, they no longer uh, did so much. And he said not only is this bad for the individuals, because they're lonely, essentially, and disconnected, it's bad for society because society is no longer networked together. Because it's not just about bowling, it's all kinds of different networks and groups, including uh, religious groups and faith groups. And um, that, that sort of, he says binds society together in a honeycomb. And so this links in with what William Beveridge wants. Charity becomes about community groups getting together uh, and you can donate towards those groups uh, if you're involved in them or if you care about them. Um, Robert Putnam uses this concept of social capital to describe what I just said. The idea is everybody's kind of linked together in uh, a network, in groups, in a kind of a honeycomb society of different groups. So can we just stop it there? Is this what charity is about now? Can we stop thinking about the relief of poverty? Can we stop thinking about um, uh, all the essential things? Uh, and can we stop thinking about the old cases? We could actually identify what we've just been talking about, the community aspect of charity, actually in the old cases if we wanted to. So in Pampsall from 1891, a very famous charity case, which sets out the beans that uh, charity represents. We've got relief poverty, we talked about that. The advancement of education, we talked about that. Uh, the advancement of religion, we talked about that. And other purposes beneficial to the community. So that was actually there, not so important, but it was there in the old cases. And so we can say then maybe that fourth theme has now become, and these are all listed in pencil, that fourth theme has now become what charity is about. Can we just leave it there? Well, some people would like to, uh, but I don't think you can. I think we have to go a bit further to understand what charity is and how the law uh, reflects that. Because, of course, poverty does still exist in the UK. And so in our social justice third year module, if you're interested in this, then you can take things a bit further if you want to. You can go beyond uh, the old cases, uh, what's called the black letter cases, uh, studying the legal materials uh, as, as, as they're uh, reported. You can go beyond that and start looking at these questions of what's modern charity and what uh, does modern charity law do in relation to the state. Of course, poverty still exists in the UK, even if it's perhaps less widespread than when the old cases were decided. And of course, it persists globally. Uh, and charitable humanitarianism is, of course, uh, international charity is, of course, a, a large and substantial branch of the sector. So actually, those old cases although I was keen to write them off before, perhaps they still have a life now. Uh, perhaps they still describe something that's going on. The state's there, but there's still a need uh, for relief of poverty charities in the UK. But we can take it even further if we're looking at what the law's doing in the modern world, because something that's happened in the last 30 or 40 years is a uh, so-called contract culture. And this is where a government actually recruits charities, pays charities, contracts with charities, and deals with charities, and says, deliver X and X service for me. The government says this, deliver X and X service for me. And if you do that, if you deliver this service, you'll get paid as a charity. 
And this is called the contract culture. Deborah Morris, who works here as a, a researcher, um, uh, Professor Morris, has uh, written on this and the contract culture. And so what does this do? Well, this is a new way of looking at law and charity together. Here we've got contract applied to charity. And this isn't intuitive at all. Most people don't think of charities like this as being in a contract with the state, essentially doing what the state asks them to. So it's not like we were talking about with Bev Ridge and Robert Putnam, uh, at these kind of leftovers once the state has got out of charity. What we've got here is the state actually jumping in there and telling charities what to do. That's different from what most people think uh, charity is and what charity law is. That's something you can do with us in the third year, like I say. And finally, if we're looking at the modern meaning of charity, it'd be wrong just to leave it without saying that charity is really, these days, very controversial. The charity sector has been rocked by scandal. So perhaps the most famous of them all is the Oxfam scandal. Oxfam being a global brand uh, representing British charity. And across uh, the world, this band is very well recognised and it's very, very damaged uh, because in Haiti, the so Oxfam workers actually sat with prostitutes on Oxfam property. Um, the kids' company scandal as well, that's Camilla batman gellidge there, dramatic collapse of that charity. It turned out that some of the uses of the money were allegedly wasteful. Uh, this rolled on in the press for a very long time. So charity has been rocked by scandal and this relates to charity law as well. So just think about yourself, how would you use the law? Could you use the law to stop the Oxfam scandal from happening again? Could you use the law to uh, stop the uh, kids company scandal from happening? One of the things you could do there, maybe, is make sure that charities always have enough money in their bank account. So it's much more difficult for them to go bust. And uh, me and my colleague, uh, Jen Sigafu, along with members of the unit and people uh, from beyond our university, some really great contributors, have written a book um, collectively, a collection of uh, different chapters called Debates in Charity Law. Uh, and Jen and I conclude by looking at these scandals and saying, what's going on? Why are there so many scandals? in the sector and, and what can the law do about it? And there's another modern question, another modern way of looking at charity and something we talk about in our third year module. Uh, and we actually conclude that you've just got to look at the size of charities. That's one a really key thing if you're going to regulate them because an enormous charity like Oxfam, a global brand, must need different rules, different ways of regulating, different levels of attention, than a small local charity, which uh, can perhaps go much more under the radar before anybody's really concerned about what it's doing. And so then we started with some of the old cases, which I say they're really very interesting. And we asked whether or not those old cases are still relevant. And the answer to that was kind of, uh, they're very much of their time. But it's not true, for example, that they're completely irrelevant. And we saw that through the relief of poverty uh, still being uh, relevant in the UK. And then we looked at people that think because the states got involved in charity, charity is something different to what it was in the past. And so uh, we looked at charities being that community and getting people uh, together. And I do agree with that to an extent. But then we went further than that. We said, what's charity law really in the modern day? And we said that it is now about contracts with charities, the government getting in there and contracting with government, telling uh, with charities, telling charities what to do. And finally, you can't look at the modern charity sector without also looking at charity scandals. And there's important questions there. Uh, what can the law do about this? Can it do anything about charity scandal? So I hope you enjoyed my taster lecture. I hope you had an interest uh, in charity law. I should say it's part of a foundational course, an element. If you are interested in it, you can take it further as you progress through your course.